Very excited to have everybody joining us. Uh, it is wonderful today uh, to have everybody this afternoon. We're very excited for our conversation today as we're discussing some of the important issues affecting everyone around the world. So I want to remind everybody two things. One is uh, uh, our conversation will be on the record for the first 20 minutes. And then when we move to questions and answer will be off the record. So please start sending your questions uh, to Estelle as we go to our conversations and then we'll jump to, uh, to, to the questions with Ambassador uh, just after 20 minutes when I ask my first question. So without taking long, Ambassador, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's, I mean, you have a very important role and critical role especially with things happening around the world. So I'm, I'm very interested to, to a little bit understand you know, we have seen many conferences on international, international energy conference on climate change. Uh, and I want to know what makes this summit special and what are the expectations uh, from this summit? Well, thank you, Yannick, and thank you, colleagues, all of you, for um, uh, having this uh, uh, discussion today. I'm really delighted to be with you, even if it's only uh, virtually. So, what is the significance of COP26? Um, I think there are two main things. The first one, of course, is that it is uh, the next one in the big series of uh, climate conferences globally. But more importantly, it is five years on from COP21 in Paris, which set us off with the massive Paris uh, agreement and Paris agenda to take it forward. Of course, really, it should have been happening last year to be five years on, um, as you know, in 2020, but we had to postpone it because of COVID. And COVID is the second reason why uh, COP26 is really important. By the time we come to November this year in Glasgow, we'll be really coming to the end of the second year of this COVID, glo COVID global pandemic, which has really hit us all in a way that nobody had really anticipated or prepared for. It has destroyed lives, education, uh, it's had a big impact on our societies and on our economies and, and our pro prospects. So when we look at these two things, we have a, a climate agenda and we have a COVID agenda that are coming at the same time. And this meeting, which we are really determined to hold in person at the highest level, if it's at all possible and safe to do that, um, it will be a moment for bringing together those two agendas and giving some hope to people to say, as we look how we are going to try to build back from COVID mm -hmm. in our societies, in our commerce, in our economies, how are we going to do that in a green and resilient way? How are we going to use it to take steps forward in all parts of the agenda, not just one part. And colleagues may remember back in 2015, it was not only the Paris Agreement and climate change that we made big agreements on, it was also the sustainable development agenda. So we, we the SDGs, our famous SDGs come from then, and also Sendai disaster risk reduction um, uh, conference, which put us on that path to building resilience to uh, uh, disaster shocks. And it, Paris was the first time that climate change was recognized globally as a rights issue. Mm -hmm. And we can see the way our rights are really impacted by climate uh, through uh, destruction of, of jobs, destruction of the environment, destruction of um, urban uh, built environment, um, uh, reduced prospects for education and schooling, and obviously impact on healthcare. Um, we see even COVID is, is a, an, a, an impact of, of climate because, and environment because we humans are pushing more into natural habitats for one reason or another because we want resources or because we want more space or whatever it is. And that is bringing us into contact with animal diseases that we did not have contact with before, which are bridging. And it's happening more and more frequently. So uh, even if you go back to HIV AIDS, if you look at SARS and MERS 
and COVID and Ebola and all of these things, they are, they are diseases that jump the gap between animals and humans. And mm. we're seeing that more frequently. So all of these things are interconnected. So we see COP26 as the major, major opportunity for our leaders at the global level to set the agenda going forward for how we deal with these things more effectively. At the same time, we also know we are still not on track for the things that we said we were going to do at Paris. So this checkpoint is also the moment when we must recognize that and we must each look at what more we are going to do as we go forward, as we build back greener, to try and make sure that uh, we touch all of those parts of the agenda. So, so you can answer, you can answer my, my second question about how COVID fits into all this. But let me go to the third question I had is, you know, we're here in Africa, you represent specific region. What Africa can expect from, you know, the summit? Especially yeah. the, especially the next, uh, was supposed to be in Africa, if I'm not wrong. You're right. And, and it's very important to remember that uh, the COP is just one moment on a long journey and it passes from hand to hand. So um, and, and the next presidency will be an African presidency. So I, I think for Africa, it's really important. Um, the Africa is this, the, the, the continent that is, uh, you know, has produced least of the impact, put it that way, on, on, on the global climate change and is most vulnerable to the impact of it. So um, when we look at um, economies that are moving and emerging, and this is really an emerging continent, mm -hmm. we want to make sure that countries have the opportunity not to go back to those old uh, style polluting uh, technologies, but that have the opportunity to leapfrog and go forward to the newer, greener, resilient, renewable energy uh, sources. And I would say um, since COP21, that has become uh, a, a reality where at COP21 it was only a dream. Um, renewable energy now um, uh, in, in some places, for example, even in the Gulf, where uh, they are very heavily uh, dependent on uh, hydrocarbons, they are now selling solar energy uh, cheaper per unit as a renewable source than, than from hydrocarbon. So, so actually the technology has moved forward in response to this uh, and, and made it possible um, for things like renewable energy um, uh, production to be done on a commercial basis. It's very commercial now. So these are opportunities for the continent of Africa because this continent must emerge and must take its full place in the trade and economy, not only within the African continent and the continental free trade agreement is very exciting for that because it really gives opportunities, um, but also more broadly. At the same time, you know, there are, there are different elements of this climate change um, agenda. There is the mitigation agenda, which is about reducing those emissions and greenhouse gases and keeping, trying to keep close to 1.5 degrees uh, rise in temperature. And then there is the adaptation and resilience part of the agenda. Yeah. And that is really about how do we make sure that our systems, our processes, our economy, our, our the way we live our lives is adapted to the climate change that is already happening around us. And that requires a lot of funding. Um, and I think one of the things as the, as the presidency of, of, of the COP, um, it's not just for the UK to push this on everybody, but we are using our chairing, uh, our convening capacity to, to try and uh, put a lot of pressure on the developed countries who pledged in uh, Paris to come up with $100 billion every year for the developing world. And that 100 billion has never quite been reached. I think the maximum is about 83 billion at, uh, mm. at, at, uh, together. Um, and also to make it more accessible because there's no point in having all this money locked up in global funds that are really difficult to access. And I know some of the processes for bringing forward projects from the national level have really taken an extremely long time. So we are trying to find ways to to uh, ensure that those global funds, once they are put up there, don't stay up there. They're no good up there if they're not actually out in the ground doing things. So that's another thing I think that is very, very uh, important for um, this continent, that we should ensure that uh, there is good finance available uh, for climate issues and that it is accessible. 
and also that there is a good balance between finance that is provided for mitigation actions and for adaptation actions. So I, I want to talk about a little bit of the, the, the climate finance, which is one of the challenges, but a little bit uh, follow up on what you, you think you say. How does this fit, COP26 fits into Paris Agreement? How does COP26 fit yes, into fit the Paris, into Paris Agreement? Agreement? Yes. In in the sense of um, when when does it uh, when does it you see uh, we are five years on from from Paris, which was in in as I said 2015, and the, what we agreed is that uh, after five years we would do a stock take. We would it would be like a checkpoint. We would have a look at how much we had achieved. Yes. And yes. were we were we reaching towards the targets? Now the clearest target is we agreed to limit, try to limit the rise of the global temperature to 1.5 degrees by the end of the century. Now, the latest scientific uh, analysis indicates, looking at the plans that we've all made and the, the actions we've taken, we are still on track for minimum of 2.4 mm -hmm. degrees increase. And therefore we are way off track for 1.5. We also agreed at Paris in 2015 collectively that we would increase our ambition um, when it came to the five year point. So at COP26, we would increase our plans. So every country so far has submitted what we call a nationally determined contribution, the NDC, the nationally determined contribution to the global effort to reduce um, greenhouse gases uh, emissions and global warming. And uh, so what we need to do is to revise our NDCs and make them even more ambitious, you know, set out how in each country we're going to do more to reduce the temperatures. So the UK, for example, um, did publish its second NDC uh, back in December. Also, it, it published um, what we call an adaptation communication to show our the main priorities on the adaptation uh, side of things and also a climate financing um, document, a pledge to the UNFCCC where for the UK, they have uh, uh, agreed to, to double the amount of uh, climate financing for the next five years. So um, all countries are supposed to really um, revise their NDCs okay. and put them in. Um, so uh, not everybody has, um, but uh, you know, it's, um, it's important that we, we encourage everybody to do that. Um, Rwanda is, uh, is in, in a very good position, I think, when it's come to its uh, commitments on um, on uh, uh, greenhouse gases and on uh, climate change. Um, they, they were one of the first countries actually to submit um, a revised NDC and, and really be a very, very good um, uh, example. Uh, it's not only, as I said, it's not only for the presidency to go around and bang on people's doors. Um, it's for us all to take our responsibilities and, uh, and be, be a, a good example. So um, I think Rwanda is really um, doing extremely well on that. Yeah, it's, it's actually very impressive uh, when you see when it comes to environment and climate change policies in Rwanda. Very, very, uh, very impressive. So just a little, so you touched a little bit of climate finance. Please, could you, for people not familiar what you're talking about, could you little give us a little bit of what's, what climate finance were you talking about when you said that? So it's rather like... Um the development agenda, the same as the climate agenda, that we recognize globally, all of us, that making these huge changes really does require financing. Now, um, we all pledged to raise this $100 billion from the developed countries for the developing countries. Um, and that's one thing, but it's still $100 billion a year. I mean, it sounds like a massive amount, but it's still not enough. Um, and it can never only be money that comes from the public sector because that's that's only a portion of it. Mm -hmm. Part of it is also about um, making sure that uh, private sector is also part of this because, as I said, things like renewable um, energy, um, you know, generation and things like this are becoming much more commercially viable. So there is absolutely no reason why governments should be paying for that. And, and there's every reason why the private sector should be paying for it, like, um, like uh, and investing in it, like other things. Sometimes governments and public sector money needs yeah. to be used to um, ensure the risk, if you like, to help the private sector to come in um, and take its place. Um, the, uh, 
I think the, the as I said before, the there is a challenge when you come. For example, uh, people will have heard of the Global Environmental Fund, the GEF, um, the Green Climate Fund, the GCF, um, yeah. various <laughs> other uh, mechanisms that go to specific things like forests or or whatever. Um, they are really difficult to access. So even if all that money is up there, you can't get it. So as I said, one of those is 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 trying to make it uh, be more accessible, um, and and. By the way, that uh, the UK bilaterally, just to, again to give you an example, it's not that I want to push just what the UK is doing. Um, when when the UK said they were going to increase their contribution for climate financing for the next five years, they doubled it essentially to eleven point six billion uh, pounds. But they made a, 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 a an indication that at least fifty percent of that is for adaptation. In other words, for the agenda that is important for African countries. Um, and the other 50% for mitigation type of um, activities. And up to now, there, there hasn't really been a good balance. More money has gone to the mitigation type of activities than, than to the adaptation. So it's really important. The other thing though, I would say is it's not just the outside world. It is for each national government to think very carefully about its priorities, how it mainstreams climate action and climate policies into its overall national development or national planning and budgeting yes. so that when you are thinking about how do you take these things forward you are integrating with communities um, so it's not just across government but down vertically right down into the uh, community level and the district level um, and making sure that climate is not seen as some kind of parallel activity because parallel lines never meet, mm -hmm. um, but that it is integrated. And we are therefore making the best and most efficient use of um, even the government funding, because in most countries, the vast amount of funding comes from government owned budget. Yeah. Um, so uh, we need to do that. But the private sector is a massive um, part of this. So we have also been, um, there's a campaign uh, which has been going globally called the Race to Zero, uh, yes. to make the private sector sign up for this. And there's a new, more recent one called the um, the Race to Resilience, which again is trying to look at this more um, risk-informed uh, uh, approach um, and try to, to make sure that funding that is going in is going into really well thought through, really integrated uh, programming. I see. So uh, let me ask the last question, then I'll open up for the audience. Um, I, I remember a couple of, I think a couple of months ago uh, when... Uh, uh, Alcon Shalman, the president of COP26, former secretary of business, if I'm not wrong, uh, was appointed. He said, the biggest challenges of our time is climate change and we need to work together to deliver, a, you know, and he went on. But he said, what, we need to work together. But if you look at the rising of anti-globalization, you know, Brexit, Trump, all these, uh, these other trends, how hopeful are you in the international cooperation system? which is very important to us to achieve this. Well, you know, I think you have to look at these things. It's like climate change Change goes over time. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at, at trends in, in international affairs and responses and globalization, those are trends that happen over time as well. I mean, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the US and, and of course the, the Trump administration withdrew from the Paris Agreement. But at the same time as that happened, there were many states and cities around the US, which is, of course, where climate change action happens, um, who, who signed up to it in their own right, because there is a part of, of the Paris Agreement that cities and regions can sign up to, not just companies and, and governments. So you, even there, you find that um, it's possible for the engagement to happen. And now the Biden administration, its first act was to come back to the Paris Agreement. So it, it comes and it goes. Um, at the same time, you can say Brexit. Uh, look, the UK is, is chairing um, COP26 and really driving forward a very, very ambitious agenda for itself and for everybody else against the background of this really complicated uh, situation of COVID that we have to, to, to tackle. So I feel that even, you know, since uh, 2015, when we began this road, this journey for the Paris Agreement, we have come so far. We really have made big changes. You know, 70% um, of GDP is now, you know, the countries who make up 70% of the world's GDP is now covered by net zero um, pledges. 
That was not the case in 2015. So we've made rapid progress and we're going to continue making progress through these mechanisms because uh, pretty much every country in the world now, as I say, they've all um, submitted their NDCs, they've all made these pledges. We are working um, through the G7, through the G20, through all of these, uh, these revitalized, if you like, um, mechanisms, the G77 even also, it's very, very much broader, to make sure that um, these uh, these global commitments are fully taken up. And you know, the globe is not just about those uh, few big countries. This continent has a massive interest in this and is a massive um, influence in the way the climate agenda is taken forward, just as it has been in the way the sustainable development agenda has been designed and taken forward. And we are all humble enough to know now that there is no country in this world that is developed. And there is no country in this world that is free of climate change. We are all somewhere on the uh, on the spectrum of this and we are all trying to improve ourselves and get better. So um, I think we, we do have a very good um, uh, international prospect of um, moving this forward and continuing to make progress. So excellent. So uh, let's get questions from the audience. Please, if the team can send us a question, that would be wonderful. We have... Uh... Also helping to build resilience. Um, the other thing that I that I um, find, and, and this also comes from having worked before in the continent of Africa, I feel very, very strongly that we have to make sure that we are working with the young people and um, the youth of the, the countries. Globally, we are living in the biggest youth bulge in history, in human history. There are more young people now than there have ever been um, at one time uh, on this planet. And uh, it's not only that young people are the future, young people are the now. Young people are in positions that uh, are, are making decisions. Young people are running businesses. Young people are at school learning things. Young people are um, having children and, 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 and looking to the future. So, you know, we are the people who now have to listen to the youth. And, and make sure that they understand also the impact of their actions. Um, if we don't teach our youth about how we can do things better, recognizing the mistakes that were made in the past and saying, oh, we know that this is not the right way now. We want to help you avoid making the mistakes that we did. Okay, so um, uh, there's a very big part of it is that. There is a Youth, um, a youth for Climate Summit um, later this year, which is part of the run up um, to the COP, which our partners in Italy will be hosting. Um, and that's another really big um, opportunity for young people, for example, to come together and have that voice. Because again, as I say, that's where the future is and that's where, that's where the ideas and innovation uh, come from. Ambassador, thank you for, very much for your time and for engaging uh, discussions and, and thank you for your taking time. And it's amazing, I see a lot of private sector people join us and ambassador, some ambassadors in Rwanda, thank you for joining us. Oh, the minister also joined us a little bit later, but thank you guys uh, for, for all everybody who joined us and Ambassador Rogan, wish you all the best. Uh, you know, we hope to see in Rwanda, let's check the Golita at some point. Uh, it always will come here. I, you know, as soon as we, we get to the point where, where travel is allowed and we can do that without, uh, with safety to ourselves and to everybody else, then I will be the first one on the plane. 